Carthage's Last Stand But if the land of Canaan saw a resurgent people regain independence, the story was otherwise in the great city of Canaanites in the west. After the death of Hannibal, Carthage had continued to try to work out its destinies within the limited area allowed it by the victorious and vengeful Romans. Industriously, the Carthaginians struggled to cultivate their fields, sell their produce, invest their profits. They did this all under the endless harassment of the Numidian king, Massinissa, who had the Romans on his side and who prolonged his life well into the 80s. He raided the shrunken Carthaginian territories, and the frustrated Carthaginians could do nothing for the peace terms forbade them to make war without Roman consent. When they appealed to Rome, they were invariably rebuffed. However outrageous Massinissa's provocations, Rome always backed him, and Carthage could do nothing. Yet Rome was never satisfied. The mere fact that the Carthaginians lived and prospered was an affront to them. One old Roman senator, Marcus Portius Cato, headed a mission to Carthage in 153 BC, and was so angered by the sight of its prosperity that thereafter he dinned into the ears of the Roman Senate at every possible occasion the refrain, Carthaginim delende esse, that is, Carthage must be destroyed. Rome had its chance in 149 BC, when Carthage, badgered beyond endurance by Massinissa, finally tried to defend itself. At once, Rome declared war. The frightened Carthaginians backed down immediately and asked for terms. The Romans demanded 300 young men from the best families as hostages. They were sent by the submissive Carthaginians. The Romans next sent an expedition to Carthage and burned whatever shipping they could find in the harbor. They further demanded that the Carthaginians give up all their arms since they were not allowed to make war in any case. The Carthaginians gave up their arms. The frightened Carthaginians backed down immediately and asked for terms. The Romans demanded 300 young men from the best families as hostages. They were sent by the submissive Carthaginians. The Romans next sent an expedition to Carthage and burned whatever shipping they could find in the harbor. They further demanded that the Carthaginians give up all their arms since they were not allowed to make war in any case. The Carthaginians gave up their the Romans then ordered the Carthaginians to leave the city and retire to villages not less than 10 miles from the coast. And here at last, the Carthaginians rebelled. If their city was going to be destroyed, then they had nothing to live for. And if they were going to die, they might as well take a few Romans along with them. A maddened Carthage made ready to fight. The very temples became workshops for the making of arms, and the women contributed their hair to make bowstrings. The Carthaginians fought with absolute desperation, one and all determined to die where they stood, rather than surrender, and the astonished Romans found themselves with a major siege on their hands. For two years the desperate city defied them, and in that interval Carthage's two great enemies, Cato and Massinissa, both died, the former at 85 years of age, the latter at 90. Neither of these cruel old men was able to live to see Carthage destroyed. Both spent their last days watching Roman arms humiliated again by a Carthaginian adversary in a Third Punic War. But in 146 BC, the inevitable end came. Carthage was taken and burned to the ground. Many Carthaginians chose to die in the flames, fighting to the last. Those that did not were slaughtered and enslaved. The Romans swore never to allow a city on that site again. To this determination later Roman generations did not adhere, for the site was too good a harbor. A century later, a new Carthage was founded, but a Roman one. The old Carthaginians of Phoenician descent were gone forever. Few Carthaginian villages nearby remained for some time, and in these the Punic language might still be heard, but gradually they dwindled and died too. The very books of Carthage were destroyed, so that not even a disembodied voice would remain to speak on the side of that city 
against the polemics of her Greek and Roman enemies. But Canaan itself remained. The old Phoenician cities of Tyre and Sidon even had a kind of shadowy independence, thanks to the decline of the Seleucid monarchy, and of course, there was a rising Maccabean kingdom of the Jews.